Hello. Okay, so thank you first of all very much for um, inviting me to be here. It, it's a very great honor to speak to you all. Um, we're all gathered here to think through possible futures of Greece. And while we think about Greece's future, I want to reflect with you briefly about Greece's distant past. And of course, I don't mean in sense of time, I mean not place. So, as I'm sure you all know, there was the, before there was the Delphi Economic Forum, there was the oracular sanctuary of Apollo. Now, we might think of these things as very different, and of course, in many of the most obvious ways, they are. But in other ways, there are some marked similarities, especially with regard to futures thinking. And as an ancient historian and someone who used to work in strategic planning, in what follows, I want to talk to you a little bit about ancient Greece's glorious history of thinking about the future. And I offer this humbly, knowing that I'm an English scholar who is extremely privileged to reflect on this amazing culture. So as I'm sure you will know, ancient Greek society was famously obsessed with managing future uncertainty. So it's a key theme of ancient Greek myths. There are lots of individuals who could see the future and communicate about the future. For example, Tiresias, who spent some time both as a man and as a woman. Um, but not just men, so there's, there's Circe, who turned Odysseus's men into pigs and gave him advice about how to travel through the underworld. And of course, there's the Trojan princess Cassandra, who nobody believed. But the idea that the future was there to be seen was importantly not only mythical, it was also, um, it was also there in, in everyday life. So ancient Greek society, I didn't foresee that. So ancient Greek society was a society where a range of technologies were used to manage risk and uncertainty. So you might consult one of the wandering oracle sellers who went from town to town and would sell you a glimpse into your future. So for example, they might read the movement of birds and tell you what was going to happen to you from reading the natural signs around them. Or they might sacrifice an animal and read their entrails. These were all various different ways for them to claim a kind of expertise. But of course, as ever, nobody ever trusts the experts, right? So you're looking for some kind of information that's more reliable. In that case, you would go to a sanctuary, an oracular sanctuary. And of course, this was a place like the one down the road, where you could talk directly to a god or perhaps even to the dead and ask them about what was hidden or what was unclear. Now, there were many of these, at least 50 across Greece um, and in the Western Mediterranean. So one of the most famous is, of course, the one that is just here, the oracular sanctuary of Apollo in Delphi. And this was a place that people would come to from all over Greece and beyond in order to consult an ordinary local woman, the so-called Pythia, who was possessed by the god Apollo, who would sit upon her tripod and would answer your questions, sometimes in verse, sometimes in riddles, and she was a figure of great mystery. She's always uh, obsessed the modern imagination of scholars. How did she do this? Now, when we look at this practice, some have said this was simply primitive superstition. But I think that if we look at it, there are much subtler processes at work. And there are some of those that are still in use in futures thinking today. And I want to highlight one in particular, and that's storytelling. And my point in what follows is that the stories a society tells itself about its future can transform the actions that it takes and help to create the very future that it imagines. And to show this, I want to share a favorite narrative from ancient Greek history and draw three conclusions from it. Now this is the story I want to share, is a report by the fifth century historian Herodotus. I'm sure you're all familiar with his writing. And it takes place on the eve of the Persian Wars, as the Persians are invading Greece and coming towards Athens. So what do the Athenians do? Well, obviously, they go to Delphi. They send ambassadors to Delphi. And there they ask for an oracle. And the oracle that they get is extremely distressing. 
It says your city will burn, your altars will run with blood. You've got to get out. And the ambassadors look at each other and think, well, we can't take that one back. That will just distress our people. We can't possibly tell them that. So what do they do? They ask for another oracle. They ask for a different future. And the response that they get is that they should trust in their wooden wall. Now, they have no idea what this means, but it isn't as bad as the last one, so they take it back to Athens. And in Athens, everyone discusses this. What can it possibly mean? Various different ideas are come up with. Is it the wall around the Acropolis, the wooden wall around the Acropolis? Others think no. No, the wooden wall is the Greek navy. And this is what Themistocles argues, and he has sufficient charisma to persuade people that he's right. It's, this is the navy. There's going to be a sea battle. And lo and behold, there is. And the Athenians beat the Persians at the Battle of Salamis. So why am I telling you this story? Is this just superstition? I think there's more to it. Importantly, the Athenian ambassadors didn't react to the oracle's response as if it was a prediction. They treated it as a story of what was possible. The Pythia offered the ambassadors an oracle that told them one story about their future and they didn't accept it. They asked for another future. And this one left their future open. As a group, they then worked out what the story was behind the oracle. They told themselves a range of different ideas. They found one that made sense. They found one they could believe in. And I think this tale demonstrates effective futures thinking. It's not concerned with predictions or getting it right. It's all about stories that offer alternative possibilities. And that's the first conclusion I want to draw from this. Now, the storytelling approach isn't anything remarkable because humans tell stories all the time. They tell them to make sense of the world around them. Stories create meaning. Stories are also highly effective communication tools. They help us to make connections. They help us to solve problems. They help us to stand in other people's shoes. And they do this because, in part because they have a powerful emotional effect. And the description of the Athenian oracle demonstrates how stories are able to seed ideas and motivate action. So storytelling as a dynamic and creative process can invite engagement and encourage a sense of agency. It can help to develop a context, a shared context, for shared understanding, for shared decision making. And that's my second conclusion. Shared storytelling can generate shared meaning and motivation. And the third conclusion is perhaps the most important. If we come back to the Athenians, we can see how they not only explored different stories about the future, they also participated in the realization of the future they had chosen. Their interpretations of the oracle, the different stories that they told each other, influenced their actions. So that's my third and final conclusion. Telling stories about the future doesn't just describe those future actions, it helps to generate them. So a final thought. Nowadays, some of the most important approaches to coping with unexpected events, from economics to the weather, involve modeling. And what we sometimes forget is that models are not intended to tell you what is going to happen. None of us knows how the future will develop, and no model, no oracle, could tell you exactly what is going to happen. As the ancient Greeks, I think, knew from the way they used oracles, it's the stories that we tell ourselves about our futures that are so powerful. They enable us to explore different possible answers, and that shapes our actions. And it's something that's been going on here for a very long time. Thank you.